Looking to see most everybody I talked to yesterday. Good to see so many folks here. We'll go ahead and get started. Good morning, everybody from Columbus. Thanks so much to our statewide media for joining the Ohio Democratic Party on this morning's virtual press conference. And also a special good morning to those of you watching us live on social media this morning. We're happy you're here as well. I'm Press Secretary Cameron Keir. Today, Representative Jeff Crossman, and also our Ohio Attorney General candidate for this upcoming election, will join us to further discuss the impacts of House Bill 6 on hardworking Ohioans, specifically how the largest corruption scandal in state history is impacting your wallets each and every day. I do want to mention Chair Elizabeth Walters was supposed to be on our call this morning. Unfortunately, she's had a death in her family, and our thoughts are certainly with her and her family this morning as she navigates uh, that difficult time. Again, Representative Crossman is here today with one purpose and that's to demand accountability from our state leaders as Ohioans continue paying hundreds of thousands of dollars each day for Republican-led corruption. Believe it or not, Ohioans are still footing the bill for years-long federal investigations and ongoing court cases. This, just as earlier this week, federal regulators ordered First Energy to come up with a plan to refund customers for millions of dollars that was paid by ratepayers to help lobby for the passage of House Bill 6. After our remarks this morning, we will open it up to questions in our Zoom meeting for reporters at that time, I'll kick things off. In the meantime, if you're in the Zoom meeting, please just go ahead and keep your microphones muted. That would help us out a lot. Thanks so much. It's now my pleasure to introduce Ohio Representative Jeff Crossman. Thank you, Cameron. I appreciate it. Um, and thank you, everybody here for joining us today. Um, and my, my uh, thoughts are with Chair Walters and her family. I'm, I'm so sorry to hear about uh, the passing of uh, her family member today. Um, but uh, as all of you know, uh, we're here today to talk about the House Bill 6 nuclear bailout bribery scandal and the continuing costs uh, to Ohioans. There's still a lot of questions about who knew what and when about this nuclear bailout bribery scandal. And there's one thing we do know, even though there's still a lot to know, it continues to cost working Ohioans a lot of money, uh, big money. And the Ohio, Con Ohio Consumers Council, excuse me, a consumer advocacy agency here in Ohio, tells us that Ohioans have already paid nearly $180 million in coal plant subsidies alone, including propping up a plant that's not even in Ohio. In fact, I went and visited that plant down in Indiana. We'll talk about that in a second. But we know the cost of this scandal runs much deeper than that. An audit of uh, First Energy released earlier this year found uh, no evidence certainly no clear evidence to show that the $460 million improperly collected from customers in the first energy footprint was used for its purpose, uh, which raises questions about whether that money was used to fund hospital six bribes. Um, and just last week, FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission ruled that First Energy must refund millions of dollars to consumers uh, to help pay back money that they may have concealed to help pass uh, the nuclear bailout bill. Lastly, and most significantly, Ohio taxpayers are footing the bill for a federal investigation, multiple federal court cases, and all of the costs associated with holding Ohio Republicans accountable for the largest public corruption scandal in the state's history. And while working Ohioans are worried about putting food on the table or covering the costs of prescription drugs, uh, Ohio Republicans are forcing those working families to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars each day to pay for a corrupt bribery scheme that never would have passed without those bribes. The contrast here could not be more clear. Ohio Democrats are focused on investing in working families through measures like infrastructure investment and child tax credit, and Republicans are focused on making more money, taking more money out of the pockets of working families to line their own pockets and the pockets of special interests. And here's the bottom line. The nuclear bailout bribery scandal, House Bill 6, is more than just a bad bill. It's a sign of how corrupt our state house has become from top down. Republican politicians, they think they can get away with raising the cost of Ohio's energy bills, taking millions of dollars in bribes, and no commenting their way out of this scandal. And frankly, it's not going to happen under our watch. Late last year, uh, my colleague and I, uh, Representative Weinstein, we went down to that coal plant, uh, coal fired power plant in, in Madison, Indiana, to see up close what Ohioans were paying for. And the one thing I know for sure after visiting is that Ohioans are getting a raw deal. Feel free. Um, so, you know, you can feel free to ask me more questions later, but, you know, about that trip. But we, um, you know, we saw a lot in uh, firsthand, uh, you know, that first of all, that tr that that coal fire power plants nowhere near the Ohio border. There's no benefit to Ohio. Uh, we know for firsthand, uh, for example, that uh, that coal fired power plant isn't pro providing any um, 
benefit to our electrical grid whatsoever and it's just costing us more money every day. So while Ohioans continue to pay more than $230,000 every single day, that's about $10,000 an hour and $160 every minute uh, for this corruption, Ohio Republicans like Governor DeWine and, and our current Attorney General Dave Yost can't even be bothered to answer questions about what exactly happened and why we're still paying for it. Quite frankly, there's been zero accountability. I'm running for Ohio Attorney General to directly um, you know, to go after this culture of corruption, state government, to finally put away, put, put more money in the pockets of hardworking Ohioans instead of taking it away. Ohioans deserve representatives who are on the side of and fighting for them. They need champions in the state house. They need champions in the state executive offices that are actually going to fight for the people of Ohio. And the only thing we see Republican politicians fighting for are bigger payouts for corporate shareholders and special interests. As the chair mentioned, or as the chair was going to mention, rather, the cost of this scandal runs wide and, and deep. Uh, it's time for politicians like Mike DeWine and Dave Yost to do their jobs and to get to the bottom of what happened here and, you know, make sure that not one other cent of Ohio taxpayer dollars goes toward funding corruption uh, orchestrated by Ohio Republicans. If people like Dave Yost aren't willing to do their jobs and fight for working Ohioans, it's time for them to just get out of the way and let those of us who are uh, serving the public and have the public's interests in mind uh, to help those people in our great state. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to take some questions if you, if you want to ask, ask me some questions. But, you know, we need to get back to a place of accountability. And I think that's really the, the, the issue here that we've seen. Uh, mo many people have sent multiple public records requests to the governor, to PCO, to other entities that have been involved in this uh, corruption scandal. And uh, we have gotten very uh, little documents in return, but even though we get more documents every day, a little bit here, a little bit there, we find out more and more information that continues to suggest that this scandal is bigger and broader than we ever first thought. And we, it's time to finally get to the bottom of all of this and, and uh, hold some folks in, to account for what, what, uh, what has happened here. Representative, thank you so much. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for your, your personal insights there after your trip down to the plant and, and kind of what's going on there. Uh, if anybody has a question, feel free to just go ahead and unmute your microphone at this time. Um, I think we're probably all familiar enough. I see Laura's hand going up first there just because she's on my screen. Laura Bischoff, Dispatch and USA Today Network. Why don't you go ahead and go first? Uh, yeah, Representative, you said that um, that uh, you've gotten back public records requests that suggest the scandal is bigger and broader. Can you specify which records um, you've received? Is it something that we haven't received? Well, I, I think you've gotten some of the documents, and I've provided some of those documents in, in the past. For example, we know uh, that the governor's office was working with Sam Randazzo to help pass House Bill 6. And so we know that the governor was involved and there's emails back and forth between Sam Randazzo's office and uh, you know uh, Laurel Dawson, for example. And so um, I believe those documents have been shared with you folks in the past, but there's been very little covered on that issue. Um, we continue to ask for documents. We've asked for more and more documents and clarified what our requests were. And we have precious little documents in return. So we're not gonna let that go, but every time we get something uh, in return, we learn a little bit more about uh, the involvement of the governor's office in the House Bill 6 nuclear bailout scandal. And, uh, you know, we demand more information because I think we need to get all of the information. And, uh, you know, quite frankly, the public deserves to know what happened because otherwise we're never going to get to the bottom of what happened and how to prevent it from happening in the future. And if you've seen one thing over the last several decades here under Republican one party rule in the state, you've seen an ever growing series of scandals from starting with CoinGate, then you had the uh, the charter school e ECOT scandal where Ohioans were getting defrauded and payday lending, uh, you know, and then now this, the largest public corruption scandal in Ohio history. Look, these scandals keep getting bigger and bigger and cost Ohioans more and more money each time. And if we're not gonna, you know, uh, fight to get to the bottom of this and hold folks that are responsible for this account to account, then this will continue to happen. Ohio will go uh, from being a once an opportunity state to continue to being number one in corruption as it's been currently ranked, which is a, it's shameful. Everybody in state government should should resign their positions. <laughs> if if I was uh, if I was uh, the governor of the state of Ohio and our state was ranked number one in corruption as it currently is, then I would be embarrassed and asking for answers, demanding answers, championing for the people, because that's what the only thing that's going to change this culture of corruption. Um, Representative, you sound a lot like um, Mark Dan, who, um, you know, beat the drum of culture of corruption right into the AG's office and 
uh, more than a decade ago. Um, why is it that this issue didn't get the Democrats any traction in 2020? I think it's a fair question. I think that 2020 had its own um, elements that um, prevented this message from getting out there. First and foremost, uh, you know, Larry Householder didn't get indicted until July of that year. So the case really hadn't gotten too far underway, in my opinion, and, you know, was kind of lost in the, uh, the, the noise of the uh, 2020 presidential election and the George Floyd protests and obviously, um, you know, COVID going on. And uh, now we've learned even more as time has passed since 2020. And, um, you know, the news isn't good. Obviously, we continue to learn more every time First Energy's audit, we find some more information about what they did and didn't do correctly. So um, I think, you know, this has the potential of, of uh, and, and quite frankly, should uh, be on the front minds of people in Ohio because it's costing the money every single day. Um, hundreds of thousands of dollars every single day that Ohioans are paying to fund two plants that otherwise wouldn't be able to stand on their own. I think people understand fundamental fairness and they don't believe that this is fair. Uh, people that I talk to about this story, uh, they're just aghast that this thing is actually uh, you know, occurred to begin with, and, and there's been very little done uh, to hold folks to account. And quite frankly, and that's my biggest issue with our current attorney general, I mean, he certainly filed a civil lawsuit, but there's been no additional investigation. You know, the state of Ohio has anti-bribery uh, statutes on its books. The state of Ohio has similar laws on its books that the federal government does and has the resources and ability to conduct investigations and to actually, you know, hold some folks to account and bring some charges. And none of that's being done, none of it. And uh, I think Ohioans understand that uh, you know, people need to be held to account for uh, their misdeeds. Thanks, Laura. Uh, Jim, you were in the chat with a question. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, um, for Representative Crossman, um, you've you've mentioned that you're against the uh, the coal subsidies, uh, but that for right or wrong, the uh, state lawmakers made the choice to keep those subsidies in place. And as uh, Attorney General, wouldn't you be obligated to defend that law? Would you? Well, I'm not going to do. I'm not going to defend illegal conduct. I can tell you that, and and I think the the coal subsidies uh, are a function of illegal behavior, and those things probably never would have passed to begin with if we had an honest and transparent process. In fact, as you know, uh, there had been multiple efforts by First Energy and others to gain subsidies. Uh, in various iterations of those bills. Frank LaRose, I think, was a sponsor of one of those bills early on in his Senate career. So, uh, you know, those things never passed in the in prior years. And, you know, given the fact that the subsidies were passed by virtue of uh, bribery, I don't think I would be obligated as attorney general to uh, defend illegal and unethical conduct. Thank you. Uh, Denise from Finley Courier was next, and then I've got, uh, looks like Andy after that. Hi. Hi. Yes. Um, I think I'm going to echo what we heard earlier about the documentation. Uh, what's frustrating to me is I, I realize that the householder case is moving through courts. I realize that there is banter in Columbus about what's what's going on and continues to happen with House Bill 6. But as a reporter, I need documents and I need to be able to track movement. And that's very frustrating. We have a representative, Representative John Cross, that was literally on several of the energy committees when he was being reelected. He took money from the super PAC and I need to be watching what's going on with this, with all of it but it's a lot and newsrooms are strapped. And I'm wondering like, you know, I need a clearing house. I need, <laughs> I need something. And, and, I, and I hear you say, you know, we've given you folks this stuff. I haven't received it. I haven't seen it. I've been very frustrated with the lack of coverage uh, with all of this. It just seems like it's, it, it's just such a big issue but we're seeing very little. We're not seeing it at all. Yeah, and, and my, by the way, my comment was not to be critical of folks in the media. I know you're doing your level best out there, and, and many of you have covered these stories um, and done a great job doing it. Um, you know, we've had press conferences where we've showed uh, documentation, and um, so so that's what what I'm referring to. Uh, back in August, I believe, or September, I did a press conference and 
and you know the reason for that press conference was because I had sent multiple pr uh, public records requests to the governor's office and to the PCO, and not one had been even answered. And uh, I think the day of the press conference, uh, Governor DeWine gave us uh, maybe eight pages of emails. <laughs> I think it was. And one of those emails definitely showed a connection between Laurel Dawson and Sam Randazzo. So obviously those two uh, parties were working together to pass House Bill 6. Uh, Larry Householder didn't work alone. OK, Larry Householder didn't work with just the, the three people uh, that were charged in uh, the original uh, filing by the federal government. We know that there were other legislators involved on the Republican side of things. And quite frankly, I'm, I'm shocked that um, uh, other folks haven't been, uh, you know, called to account on this stuff, not by necessarily the media, but certainly by uh, the DOJ or, or, quite frankly, our own state government. You know, we have bribery books, we have conspiracy laws, we have all kinds of things on, on in, in Ohio law that could be utilized to get to the bottom of this information, uh, to, to investigate what happened and hold, hold people to account. I mean, ultimately, that's what we need to happen here. Otherwise, Ohio is never going to be able to move forward. We're going to continue to have a series of corruption scandals, whether it's this one or the next one, uh, unless we hold folks to account, unless we send a message that illegal bribes are not appropriate conduct in state government. Okay, let me let me rephrase my question to where it doesn't sure. look like a rant and defensive. How can I best watch what's happening with the householder case with House Bill 6? How can how can I do that? Well, that's a great question. You guys are really good at being journalists, so you probably ask all the, the right parties and right questions. And it's probably been very frustrating to watch uh, the governor no comment his way out of things. So I think we're all doing what we can to uh, get the information and to deliver that information to the public. Um, so I don't if I have the magic bullet, I'll be happy to share it with you. But uh, I'm going to continue to do what I'm doing, which is to have these kinds of meetings to um, you know, provide the documents uh, that I get from uh, from PCO and the governor's office. For example, uh, I think maybe a week or two ago, I got Sam Randazzo's personnel record. I presume you all have that. Uh, I'm happy to turn over everything that I get from the public records requests that I do, uh, because I think, you know, the public needs to see that stuff. Um, so I'm happy to deliver all that stuff because I've been asking for it. I know you all have been asking for this stuff. And quite frankly, barring uh, lawsuits to help expedite, um, you know, the, the, the delivery of these documents, I'm not sure what much more we can do. Um, do you post the documents that you have on a website or how we are can you? We, we can certainly do that. We can work with uh, some folks to make that happen. Happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Andy Chow, State House News Bureau. Hey, Representative. Um, when it comes to the goals that you have on cracking down on corruption, if you were to be Attorney General, and then looking back at how the legislative process played out with HB6, what would you as attorney general have done differently? What role would the AG play in the legislative process if you think something like this might happen again? Well, certainly the attorney general has the authority and the resources to investigate criminal conspiracies. And again, we can't really you know, formulate a, a, a solution without understanding what the problem was to begin with. And, you know, that's been, I think, everyone's frustration is that, you know, Governor DeWine has not been honest. He has not been transparent. Um, I think everyone has just simply circled the wagons and hoped that this thing would go away. And, you know, it's up to people like, obviously, I feel responsible to, 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 to uh, continue to ask questions, to continue to push on this issue. It's why I decided to run for Ohio Attorney General. I could have run for re-election, but I chose not to because, you know, nothing's ever going to change unless people stand up and demand accountability. So um, to answer, I don't know if that answered your question or not, but I mean, I, first and foremost, I would have actually done some investigation, issued some subpoenas, talk to some of these folks that actually uh, were responsible for passing the largest, uh, you know, uh, bailout in Ohio's uh, history here 
and uh, orchestrated the largest uh, public corruption scandal in Ohio's history. So uh, I don't know that any of that's been done. Uh, like I said, I know a, a civil lawsuit was filed. It's very, very low hanging fruit. It's not really accomplished much. The state legislature basically did what the civil lawsuit is already trying to do. And I'm not really clear what's gonna happen with that or if, if anything productive is actually gonna come of it. But certainly there are criminal laws that could be enforced uh, here and uh, the power of the pulpit, so to speak, uh, could be utilized to, to get, to, to get more answers and to bring criminal charges against the people uh, responsible. Now, if you and I compare this uh, to, you know, what happened in, in Cuyahoga County government about 15 years ago when the county commissioner was responsible for uh, for uh, or ultimately convicted of federal criminal charges, he was also charged with state criminal charges. Okay, and the prosecutor at the time and the, and the county prosecutor at the time knew that he could bring state criminal charges because obviously a federal law has been broken, so has state law. So. You know, there is an ability here to ask more questions and have the power of the subpoena, the power of actually criminally indicting people to hold folks to account. And none of that has been done. We're waiting on the federal government to clean up our own mess. And I think that's that's inexcusable. Are you saying the attorney general should have been and then in the future should be more proactive during the legislation process? Uh, so looking back on HB6, are you saying, I mean, not to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like you're saying, uh, the writing was sort of on the wall about possible shady dealings going on. Would you have been more proactive and would you be more proactive in the future, even when a bill is still taking form? Yeah, let me be clear. I'm not suggesting that the attorney general knew the bribery was going on during the formulation of House Bill 6. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that once that bill was passed and once it became clear that there was some shenanigans going on with that, uh, that's when action should have been taken. OK, so it's not being proactive in the legislative stage of things. However, you know, when the ballot initiative was going on that August of uh, 2019, there were clearly shenanigans involved. And, and I understand why the attorney general probably didn't do much because his best, best buddy, Matt Borges, was involved. So, I, you know, there, there just were questions not asked and, you know, stones not overturned because people didn't want to know. Uh, it was sort of like, hear no evil, see no evil. And, uh, you know, so at that stage, I think something could have been done or, or been a little bit more proactive than, um, then was done. And, and certainly after the indictments, there should have been, you know, <laughs> a lot more activity around this stuff. Nothing has been done. Thanks. Thanks, Andy. I have uh, two more questions in the chat. Uh, and to be respectful of Representative Crossman time, this will be our final two questions this morning. Uh, Laura Bischoff first uh, from the dispatch with a follow up and then Andy Tobias from cleveland.com will wrap us up. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'm going to sneak in two questions. One is um, the trial for the householder case isn't expected to start until fall or even late fall. How do you think that's going to impact the election? And then you mentioned uh, Democrat Jimmy DeMora, the Cuyahoga County Commissioner, being charged with state charges. Were those charges simultaneous to federal charges? Because, you know, there's a kind of a line of thought that there's a danger in the state mucking up the federal investigation by wading in too soon. Uh, I don't recall the exact specific timing on that, uh, Laura, uh, to answer that question. Um, I can look it up. Yeah, uh, but but certainly it happened around the same time. And, and, you know, regardless of, you know, so quote unquote, mucking up the Larry Householder investigation, there's certainly other ancillary players, you know, involved. And so um, Sam Randazzo hasn't been charged with anything, you know. First Energy admitted in federal court filings that it actually bribed Sam Randazzo. I mean, doesn't doesn't negate the fact that the Attorney General's office and others can actually do investigation work to pre uh, to set the table, so to speak, on those uh, uh, on those opportunities to file those state charges. And so uh, that's where I think that you know there's been a real failure here. There has been actually zero uh, indication that uh, that any investigation uh, has or ever will be done. Uh, to protect Ohioans. And as, as whether or not uh, this is going to impact the election, I guess time will tell. But our goal here is to continue to make sure that Ohioans ask questions because it's costing them money every single day. And it will continue to cost them money unless people are held to account. Um, yeah, I'll just try to ask my question. Sorry, I've got my son in the background for any weird noises you might hear. But uh, so you, you were talking about um, the ability that the attorney general's office might have to pursue criminal charges and things like that. Are, are you, do you think that there are people who should be charged who have not? And, and if so, who? 
again, I haven't seen all of the answer. I haven't seen all of the, uh, the uh, I don't think anybody has seen all of the documentation, right? I think that's why the investigation should be conducted. And the attorney general can certainly refer criminal charges if they find stuff during the course of an investigation. None of that has been done. And, and so regardless of whether or not the federal government is investigating, the state has the authority and the legal right to do their own investigation. So um, that's what I'm talking about is there's just been very little indication that anything has, has been done or ever will be done to bring state criminal charges against those responsible. Again, Larry Householder did not act alone. He had people helping him. Um, and I think it's important for Ohioans to know everything. What did these folks know and when did they know it? How are they involved? Why, you know, why is Governor DeWine so reluctant to answer questions on this stuff? And, you know, how much involved was John Houston, who First Energy called their golden boy? How much was he involved? I mean, these, these, these are not just political questions. These are good government questions. Transparency is important to the people of Ohio because otherwise we get bills like this one that continue, I mean, the meter continues to run. I'm sitting here watching this thing. $232,000 a day, $180 million the, out of Ohioans' pockets to fund two, two uh, power plants that would not, not otherwise be operating, one of which isn't even in the state of Ohio. Thank you. Thanks again to Representative Crossman and for everyone for joining us this morning. Um, and thank you to the Ohio Consumers Council for aiding us in providing the information that Rep Crossman was just talking about here with this counter that you see on the screen. Um, we're gonna continue to work on this. We're gonna continue to push for these answers uh, that Ohioans deserve. Uh, in the meantime, if uh, I did see a question in the chat um, from Denise, um, Communications Director Matt Keyes and I will work to get that answer for you uh, later today. Uh, anyone else who has any questions following the press conference, we will be sending out a release um, and certainly uh, feel free to reach out to us uh, if there's anything that pops up. Uh, that we can do down the road. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us this morning. We hope you have a great afternoon.